All right. Well, let's get this. Uh, no, we can't hear you, April. Uh, we're we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we do have some technical difficulties with April sound, but she'll get that figured out by the time we, we talk to her. Um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody to our first collaborative webinar that we're doing uh, with CORE and our, our strategic partners. Um, the whole intent of this webinar series is to bring together uh, multiple viewpoints around uh, a subject area. And if there are other subject areas that you would like uh, to, uh, to be uh, webinar topics, um, please shoot us uh, a message in the chat. Um, we do have the Q&A. Um, if you have questions, please ask them. We will answer them as, uh, as, as we go through the presentation, but we'll have uh, an ending Q&A session as well. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, actually start with the lawyer because they talk the longest um, uh, and, and that way we can, we can kind of regulate this. However, um, I, I think it also makes sense in the sense that um, we all think we have an idea of what cybersecurity exposure is, what a risk is. Um, and rather than diving right into the technical aspects of it, um, let, let's kind of get a 30,000 foot view of this is the potential damage to your business um, around uh, a, a hack or, or a breach. So we have with us uh, Matt Davis with Davis Business Law, and uh, I will turn the floor over to him. Well, hey, thanks, Christian. And I, I look at cybersecurity really in, in two two buckets, okay? And it'll be interesting to see what Chris and April think about this. Um, I look at it from a standpoint, number one, of a data breach, where you've got sensitive information that somebody's able to hack into your system and get, or maybe ransomware, where somebody actually holds you hostage. I mean, we saw a great example of that with that pipeline back east, where what they get, five million bucks out of them, and I just, saw on the news today, one of the big meat packers, um, I, I, it looks like they, um, they, they had some sort of cybersecurity issue. I'm presuming it was a ransomware. And so those both, there's, they're, different, they're different animals. Let's talk about a data breach. I mean, it can be absolutely, totally devastating, particularly if you're, you know, in possession of a whole lot of confidential information as my business is or as your business is Christian let alone think about a medical provider and what their liability could be for that with you know I would presume we're getting into HIPAA violations etc and so we have the data breach issue and from that depending on how your contracts are written you can end up with a breach of contract lawsuit for that you can end up with a negligence lawsuit from that. And then we have our friends in the government. You guys may be aware of them. And they can come knocking on your door. And, um, you know, you get a particularly bored regulator that wants to make an example out of you. It's, it's an unpleasant situation. Um, so you mentioned HIPAA. What are some other potential regulatory breaches that might, might come into play there? Well, here's, let's talk about, the big daddy of them all. Okay, 2018, the um, the Congress, again, our friends in Washington, passed what's called the NIST Cybersecurity Act, and it's 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 particular. I think it's actually called the Small Business Cybersecurity Act, and NIST stands for National Institute of Science Standards and Technology. So that is one of those just you know, alphabet soup regulatory bodies that has come up with the standards that small business is supposed to comply with to, to ostensibly not be held liable for, you know, whether it's, it would really apply more to data breaches than ransomware. So basically, if I understand you right, there's a uh, congressional law that says if you meet these standards as a small business owner, you're going to have safe harbor from lawsuits? Yeah, you would hope that it's that easy. Um, as, you know, when I see any sort of 
congressional or legislative delegation to an agency. And sometimes they'll even do it to, for instance, um, they've delegated, OSHA has delegated all the electrical stuff to the down to the National Electrical Safety Code, which is created by a private agency. And these regulations that, whether it's a private, that are adopted privately or from a private group or a, a, a government agency does, they are, they're to me just ways for trial lawyers to nail businesses to a cross. Fair so enough. that's why I was taking a deep breath when I saw that. You, you look at it and you go, oh, okay, well, if I comply with this, then I'm out of hot water. That's, you know, that's, that's your, you know, that is a reasonable person's initial thought about that. Just throw that out the window because what it is, is it's just putting out a bunch of standards up there that frankly, nobody in their right mind can comply with because you would just spend your entire life trying to comply with all the damn rules they came up with. Sorry about my language, but you know. All right. So, so it, it, it's, it's, it's an issue that covers all industries. So you might have some specific regulatory issues like in the medical, if you've got patient information, I know we have uh, requirements because from the IRS because we're handling uh, taxpayer information um, and, and all, of our, all of our software manufacturers that we use have to comply with all of those standards. Um, so the, 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 the long and short of it is that you have exposure legally if you're bro breached regardless. Yes, and it cannot be pretty. So you, you mentioned ransomware. So that's a little different. Uh, Chris, do you want to give us a brief definition of what ransomware is for those that don't know what that is? Yeah, so essentially ransomware, uh, it can come in many forms, um, but once an infection machine, it encrypts or it especially encodes your, your data, and then it leaves a nice little note on your computer telling you how to send them money to decrypt and get your data back. Okay, so what are the legal There's implications? Quick, quick and dirty way. Okay, so what are the legal implications on that, Matt? If, if you know, we, we, we haven't had our, our data stolen, we just can't access it. Well, I mean, your, your liability could be to your customers if you're unable to do your job. Um, but it's, it's more of a problem of, oh, great, I get to get out my checkbook to pay some hackers in Russia or Azerbaijan um, just to be able to use my stuff. And so, yeah, I, I don't see it so much as a liability problem. It's just a practical business problem. I mean, you you could you could think of ways, you know, give us a six pack of beer in 30 minutes. We could come up with some ideas. I'm not giving you any beer. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Chris, um, this is Chris. And I'm I apologize. How do you pronounce your last name? Maraz. Maraz. Chris Maraz with your IT. Um, Seems like this is a, an issue that's not going away. Uh, and how do you see it affecting small business owners? Yeah, that's good. There's really two main threats right now to small business owner ransomware being the, the big one in the news. Uh, the second one being business email compromise, but ransomware um, it's very simple and a quick way for thieves to turn around money. Um, you know, we're seeing this in companies with three employees who have been around for 20 years, mom and pop stores, um, and then all the way up, as uh, Matt mentioned, to the Colonial Pipeline and uh, just announced the, the world's largest meat producer based out of Colorado. So, um, you know, ransomware is a simple way to, to force companies uh, to pay, essentially. Um, the, the biggest... And I, I should also back up and say, while ransomware traditionally is just to encrypt data and force someone to buy a key to unlock it, what we're seeing now and the reason Colonial paid is because they are stealing information. So whereas previously they weren't taking that data, now they are taking that data, not only holding ransom to unlock your information, 
but also blackmailing you to not release your information to the world, um, which is why we speculate that Colonial paid uh, rumor is within hours of getting hit um, $5 million just to prevent that data from being leaked to the internet. Which, so it's very so, simple. So which, for, which, which, you know, like I was thinking like if you, it, it, ransomware, my machine's encrypted, I can't access my data. The simplest solution behind, for that is, is having reliable backup so that I can get that data. But if they're going to give it away, that's a whole nother ball of, of wax. Right. And so that's why we're seeing now, um, you know, what is that, those preventive steps and what's that, those measures we take to secure that proprietary information or in medical cases, you know, that personal identifiable, which I know, Christian, you deal with, with uh, financial as well. Um, and backups are the quickest way to ensure you can get back up and running in the case that happens. Um, but now that they've put in that twist of, great, now you have your data back, but we still have your information. How much are you going to pay us to, to not release it? Um, it's kind of the big, the big wrinkle that we're seeing now at this point. Um, so really, as you're looking to protect yourself as a small business owner, make sure that you review. And that's part of when, when Matt referenced the NIST um, framework, it provides a framework for companies to, to go. And part of that is to identify what data you have. So what do you need to protect? What do you need to kind of cordon off from everything else on your network? Identify what you need to back up so that if you have a, um, you know, a ransomware attack, you can get that information back quickly. How do you protect it? How do you detect that threat? And then how do you, you know, respond and recover from that? Uh, so, and backups being the absolute most critical way to prepare yourself in the event of a ransomware attack, which can come across as being someone targeting your business specifically or someone on your staff just happen to search the wrong term and click the wrong ad on the Google page. Um, it comes in all different shapes and sizes. So our, our experience, and this is obviously a, a big issue for us and something that we uh, monitor closely, um, is I think the thing that I've realized is the, you know, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link and the technology can be there, but the weakest link is almost always going to be the person. Um, mm -hmm. So th that person that goes to a website that they shouldn't, clicks on a link, opens an attachment in an email that they shouldn't. Um, how do you address the human element? I mean, if, if we're talking about yeah. the weakest link. Yeah, you're 100% right. The vast majority, and I'm not going to make up a percentage, but the vast majority of infections or breaches come through the person. Um, I mean, hackers, it's a, they're major corporations, essentially. So you have these cyber criminals who have offices in Russia and act as corporations, um, training how to get past people. Um, and there's some fantastic staff security training available now from numerous organizations where you can send your staff through 30 minute, 60 minute training to identify attacks. Um, there's resources that will do monthly, weekly simulated phishing attacks to help your staff better identify what those look like. Um, and then there are services um, such as Microsoft has where uh, when you click one of those links in your email, a service will scan that link before it allows anybody to proceed to, to download that. So there's a number of training resources available as well as technology things. Um, and whether we're talking about business email compromise where you have yourself or maybe a vendor of yours whose account's been taken over and they're sending messages to your staff, how you can identify those incredibly legitimate looking emails. Um, and honestly, what we find a lot of times is the quickest way to verify that is the old school way. Pick up a phone and call someone. Did you really, <laughs> did you mean to send this to me? Is this from you? Did you really change your account information where I'm supposed to send this hundred thousand dollar wire transfer? Um, you know, so we say always err on the side of, of caution and, you know, pick up the phone and, and don't respond to the email, but, you know, verify another way. 
Well, I, I, I'll give a war story here. One of our clients, and uh, this has been a couple of years ago, um, their, their employee sent us on our form a change of bank account information. So we verified it. We knew it was right. We knew it was from the client. The problem was that that employee had got spoofed. She thought she'd gotten a legitimate email from her boss. And so we, we made the, the change, processed the payroll. Uh, I don't know what this says about the owner not noticing for six months, but he didn't notice for six months that his paycheck wasn't getting deposited. Maybe it wasn't a large amount. I don't know. Any case, it, it, he didn't find out about it until he looked in his bank account and said, I'm not getting my paycheck six months later. Um, and I, I think the thing I take away from this in my experience is it, it's about an attitude of diligence because it, it's, it's inconvenient, you know, two-factor authorizations and, uh, you know, picking up the phone to confirm an email. It seems like a pain in the ass, but the reality is these are very sophisticated criminals. Yeah. Any opinion on that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting how, you know, when we first saw ransomware, it was, um, you know, pretty simple. Um, and anytime there's a large opportunity to make or steal money, um, you have those cyber, the cyber gangs and, you know, mafia style move in uh, and, and turn that into a way for them to, to make money. Um, and so it is extremely sophisticated now. Uh, we're starting to see with, uh, you know, we had phishing emails who would impersonate, um, you know, users. And now we're actually seeing companies who are targeting, you know, Fortune 100 companies are using um, dark web technology to essentially simulate videos and simulate voices of CEOs so that they can send out incredibly um, difficult to identify um, requests to people. Now, Will that come I down want to sleep business? tonight? Who knows, but... I want to, I want to sleep tonight. Yeah. <laughs> you sleep. So, you know, all that to say your policies need to be, need to be good. Um, you know, whether it's double verification um, and you also want to make sure that who you do business with, you ask them what their processes are um, just because, uh, you know, what we've seen, uh, we had a client who um, they Someone set up an email account that was one letter different from their from their main account they use. Um, took over their accounts, uh, intercepted emails between their accountant, and then continued the conversation on this other email account that was one letter off, so very hard to identify. Thankfully, the um, the vendor they worked with had verification process in place, um, and so when the wire transfer for fifty grand came about. They called in the office to, to confirm that and, you know, identified uh, that it was actually a scam. So, yeah, it's, it's also good to make sure that who you do business with is, is you know, trying to stay on top of it also. Well, that, that's, that's an excellent point. And, and Matt, I want to get your opinion on that as far as how, how we can address that legally with our vendors. Um, but before, before I, I get that, I want to introduce April Rhodes with Canopy Insurance. Assuming, April, that you got your uh, uh, um, audio to work. Let's hope so. Can you hear me Yay! now? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, April, we, we've talked a lot about the risk and how mm -hmm. we mitigate it. Uh, what happens if all of that fails? Well, I like that you let them speak first because they touched a lot of points on there that all those things that they talked about go in um, to how a policy is rated and, um, and the coverages and stuff. And so let me just go with a, just a simple definition of the cyber and liability coverage. Um, it's just can, can help you cover losses from a cyber attack um, and other related risks um, like privacy investigations and lawsuits. That's a super simple definition, but the coverage itself is not necessarily that simple. Um, it's, I mean, as obviously Chris and Matt both touched on, I mean, this is an area that um, is continuing to um, advance and it's more 
Um, it's happening more often. And so it's, it's a line of coverage that is, is also um, changing. And uh, I mean, it's actually only been around since around in early 2000s. And so when it comes to actually writing these policies and underwriters writing these policies, you know, there's not a substantial amount of loss information. And so it's, like I said, it's continued to evolve. So, you know, that what, what you, you told me right there tells me that the way insurance works is they come up with a new coverage and then over time they figure out how not to pay on it. So, <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's, that's the reality is they, they, you know, they get experience, they get claims and they realize, oh, well, we need to write this into our, our contract and exclude this. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we want to exclude pandemics. Uh, we didn't have that one in there. Right. So right? Yeah, uh, you're exactly right. That is something that, I mean, every line of business uh, of, of insurance coverage, it is ever changing. I mean, like you said, the pandemic, all of my commercial policies will now have virus and bacteria uh, exclusions on them. So there are things that those, I mean, like I said, every carrier is going to have different packages, different coverages for cyber and all commercial insurances, but there's always the coverages, the limits in which you have limits of coverage and exclusions. So, so what are, what are the, what are the typical coverages on, on a, so on a as I said, this is out of all coverages too. This is not necessarily a one size fits all as if you had like, so you had a lawn company, you know, two lawn companies, their policies might look exactly alike. alike. However, with the cyber, that is different, but a lot of the coverages in which that they provide are like the data restoration, which would be like the cost to replace or restore the electric, the data, um, loss of income. Sometimes the loss um, covers the loss of sustained within that, within that, that shutdown. Um, those are definitely some of the, the main ones. ones but, that we've but one thing you didn't mention was legal coverage. So yeah. If, if my if my um, customers sue me because their data got out, does that get covered? There are some coverages with that. Um, one thing that's different too about um, cyber coverage is each type of coverage. Like I said, that um, whether it be the ransomware, that's a, something that can be covered. Also, um, paying those people to get get that to release that information that's been encrypted. That one of the things that they do that Chris was talking about. Um, they each have their different line of uh, different limit. Um, and then one of the other ones would be crisis management. That's another one. And that's where you're going to coverage that um, computer forensic team that will actually help identify um, what the breach, where it came from, and then attorney fees and public relations and things like that. So what are the dollar limits on those coverages normally? You know, I mean, I've seen one, like I said, each, each area of breach or a covered um, um, item has its own. I see a lot of I mean, million dollar on, on each one of them. The thing about them is they each have their own limit, but the whole policy, which includes all those coverages, has one aggregate. So they don't each have their own aggregate limit. In so other that words, would be an issue. If, if there was a ransom, I'm sorry. So if, if there was a ransomware and I made a claim on that policy that uh, the ransomware caused my computer to fry and start a fire and all of my contents were destroyed. That's all going to be one event and one coverage. I know that's crazy, but yeah, that, <laughs> I like, I don't know that, that I've heard of that happening, but you know <laughs> what? I, nothing surprises me anymore, which uh, things that happen. Okay. Um, what are the things that you said an underwriter um, the underwriter is the person that makes the decision to issue the policy. Um, yep. What kind of things are they looking at when they're deciding how to price a policy or whether to issue it at all? Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, so obviously there's carriers are going to have their own way that they're, they're rating basis is, but a lot of the one, you know, but they kind of have their main ones that they hit. Um, obviously the size of the business um, on a regular policy, you know, let's say a commercial general liability, you're going to look at the number of employees, the payroll, and like the total cost or your sales, something like that. This goes even more in depth. It doesn't necessarily look at those numbers. It's more of like what your data is, how many electronic um, um, 
how much data do you have? Like what kind of network security measures you take? A lot of the things that Chris touched on that you need to do to um, help um, prohibit um, all these hacks, all those things are things that they take into account. So, I mean, in, in what information is it that you're storing? Is it like, is it that health information? Obviously, if you're in the medical field, those policies are going to be uh, much more extensive and uh, really need to dig in and look to look and make sure that you're, you're have some coverages available. But I mean, if they'll I'm even a, go to. If I'm a retail store and I, all I'm tracking is customer purchases, that's not as risky. Right. It's not going to be as high as smaller businesses. I mean, and like, um, Unless like Chris was well, saying, never mind. do what? Never mind. Uh, but they'll even look at your website. I mean, like, are your, is your website just information only is, or is it accessible or do you do transactions on there? All those things, I mean, are things that they take into account when, um, when deciding a, whether to write your policy, which they will, it's just more into the, what's the premium going to be. Now, Chris, I have a question I'm putting in the queue for you around, uh, she said devices and it made me think of mobile. So I, I want you to um, kind of come back. I'm going to come back to you on on specifics around mobile technology. Uh, and and Matt, you can answer this from a legal standpoint as well about like what what we should do. Um, should should we provide devices to our employees for business use and and make sure that they meet some standard? Can should we do that? Can we do that? Can we limit what? they do on their own device, et cetera. But my first question back to you, if you, if you recall, um, was, shit, I've already forgotten what it was. What was it, Chris? I was talking to you, I said, I'm gonna come back to Matt. Now, uh, I, Matt, I did, didn't know it, I'm sorry. Did, did, <laughs> do you remember what question I posed to you? And I said, put a pen in it. All right, well then just answer that one about employees. How can we legally protect ourselves with our employees and their actions as it relates to cybersecurity? I'm going to punt that question to Chris because I'm more interested in how you can practically uh, protect yourself because I think you guys have figured out that this has me generally terrified. Um, <laughs> well, it should. Yeah, it, it does. It keeps me awake. Yeah, it, it does. And, you know, I have, I've noted several delicious moments of cynicism, you know, from all four of us on this panel. And I'm, you know, I'm more concerned about how you just practically prevent it. And I, I think part of it is by training your employees to not, you know, open a bunch of idiotic emails or B, not go pick up a flash drive in the parking lot and see what's on it. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah, that's that's a good good advice right there. I, I heard a story once about one of the big tech companies that had the, the 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 cyber criminals were just leaving flash drives around the parking lot, and one of their employees just plugged it in, and bang, there you go. Well, let's see what this is. Ooh. So, Chris, what, what what are your thoughts on on practical uh, ways business owners? What 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 can we leave here today with? What can what can I do? And, yeah. and specifically around uh, mobile devices. Yeah, so the, the good news is it's, it's getting easier to put the pieces in place to best protect yourself. Um, I think we'd all agree, and this goes across with so many aspects of business, um, all you can do is best practices. Um, there's always going to be one-off situations, there's always going to be someone looking how to cut those corners. All we can do is the best we can. And, and there's then a lot of good tools. Policy. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's part of that best practice. You say, right. um, you know, we, we now with, with our business, we run a lot of reports for our clients, uh, compliance reports, um, you know, framework reports that they can turn into their insurance company that says, here's what we're doing from our security standpoint that they have to have that to go to underwriting to get coverage. Um, you know, it's the same thing with, um, with, with the, the law firms that we either work with or that we've had to use, you know, 
This past year, we had to update our terms and conditions with some new legalese to better protect ourselves. And part of that was a catalyst of going to get insurance. They said, you need to add this policy to your stuff. Now, as far as, that, as, far as mobile technology and protecting yourselves, ironically enough, the exact same tool that ransomware uses to hinder our business is what we want to use to protect it, and that is encryption. So um, by default now, iPhones, uh, Android phones, those devices are encrypted. You may remember this. It got bad press from, you know, whether it's uh, shooting attacks where people cannot get into a phone to retrieve information. Um, but from a good use of technology standpoint, it protects us from, from hackers and, uh, you know, unsolicited access. So when you, on your phones, you always want to have um, a passcode or use the, the biometric, like a, you know, fingerprint, um, and that will encrypt that device. So until someone else enters that information, your data is secure if it gets lost or stolen. Now, when we talk about laptops, which is a, a we've seen throughout the pandemic, um, I mean, laptops were sold out for months. It was impossible to find laptops. One reason we recommend our clients get business class laptops is because in order for a laptop to be easily encrypted, it has to have a specific piece of technology called a TPM. It's a trusted, trusted, I forgot, trusted module. I forgot what the P stands for. Anyway, uh, it has a special piece of technology in there to provide that encryption. What is, you know, you buy a $300 laptop from Dell or from Walmart, it's not going to have that. So, um, you know, that's the reasons there are a little bit more expense for those, but those devices then allow you to encrypt those devices because with a laptop, um, you know, Matt, if you leave a laptop in your car and it gets stolen, if it's not properly encrypted, um, you know, anybody can take that, pull the hard drive out of that, stick it into another computer and see all the information. Whereas so with me, encryption, ask you this, that's this not possible. So, so Chris, what, you, you mentioned uh, laptops and, and phones. Uh, talk a little bit about wireless connectivity, especially, you know, yeah, you go to Starbucks and you plug in, you get all the warnings saying it's a, you know, public access. Right. But, what, you know, what about your home Wi-Fi? You know, uh, talk, talk a little bit about how, Wi-Fi affects the security. Yeah, so it's you know it's it's getting muddled a little bit even more um, than it used to be, and the 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 way to prevent is getting more complicated. But essentially, what we recommend it, especially if it's anything for work, you want to use a VPN. Um, on my iPad, on my laptop, even when I'm home, we still use the VPN that we use to protect that just to go above and beyond what might be necessary. And what will you, um, you know, the, v, will you explain VPN for the yeah. participants? Yeah. So VPN is virtual private network. And essentially it just creates a, a tunnel back to the secure server. So whereas without a VPN, in theory, what you do online the information you send, receive passwords, websites could be intercepted. A VPN tunnels that, and uh, encrypts it back to the, the secure, whether it's your office or another secure server. So for instance, if you buy a, um, a Chinese webcam from Alibaba, that's $15 and you connect that to your Wi-Fi at home and that just happens to be a hacked device that is designed to monitor and steal your information. Well, you've just put that into your home network where it can monitor and steal all the information that goes in and out of your home network, you obviously need a VPN to encrypt your information and prevent that from being intercepted. Now, that's an extreme case, but we have actually seen routers that have been sold on Amazon doing that exact thing. So wow. make sure you're buying brand name stuff. Make sure that you're buying the appropriate, whether it's you know business class or whatever the appropriate use case is, um, and then again, it's just those best practices. Make sure that you're doing the best you can, and and not well, just. I hadn't you know, even, I hadn't even, out. I hadn't even thought of that. But you, you're, you're saying, 
people are are reselling like Dell or Dell computers or routers or whatever with spyware or ransomware or some back door already written into it. So when you get it, you're screwed from the outset. We're seeing that happen, but I do want to make sure I'm careful to say that it's no name brand. So it's, it's not, it's not a brand that you would ever recognize or know. It's, you know, that $12 router that has the strange name you can't pronounce, um, you know, but yes, we are seeing, I mean, it's whether it's just for theft to steal and make money or whether it's, you know, actual espionage, who knows, but yeah, we, we are seeing those have been, you know, found being sold on Amazon and in different places. Um, but, but again, you know, when you're, when you're a business owner, you're buying, you know, your equipment from Dell, you're buying the appropriate um, machines for your, for your staff and stuff. That's not a big concern. It's just if you, you know, if you go to someone's house, you go to someone else's office, or when you're at the hotel, you don't know what other people are doing. And so you want to make sure that you put the precautions in place to protect yourself when you're outside of your normal environment. So I'm going to ask you this question. I want each of you to respond. Um, what, but don't, don't respond yet. Um, what is the one thing, the one takeaway that a business owner needs to implement today? If they don't already have it, you need to do this, okay? Uh, before I have the panelists answer, I'm going to give uh, the opportunity for any last Q&A, any other questions that weren't answered that you have. Uh, go ahead and type those into the Q&A. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and start with Mr. Davis. What's your one action item? What's your one go-to? First of all, Mr. Davis is my dad. And um, my go-to is find specialty coverage. So, uh, and so call April and, you know, find out, you know, if you're a lawyer, get your specialty coverage. And, uh, and of course, Chris's point will be, um, don't speak for Chris. Well, yeah. speak for Chris. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, okay. You're right. But uh, I mean, I would do that first. I mean, I would start at the last line of defense, which is, where in the world are you going to, you know, if, if all hell breaks loose, this is how you save your butt. Um, because Anything from a legal standpoint that you would say every well, business I, owner needs to address? I, I mean, the first one is deal with the catastrophes, you know, the potential catastrophes first. And when, because that's where you start and start there. And I'm not saying that dealing with, how to do it right and how to protect yourself is not important, but you got to look at what, if something, if everything possible goes wrong, that's, that's what you need to do. And I would get specialty coverage for your industry, not some blanket. And I, not some, I'm, now I'm not going to put words in April's mouth. Okay. Um, not some sort of, you know, generic cybersecurity coverage. I mean, we have specific legal cybersecurity coverage and that's that's my first line advice. And then, so, you know, talk to April and Chris and get your ducks. So, so April, we'll, we'll go to you. How much did you pay Matt to um, make that plug? Oh, uh, well, we, don't, we won't talk about that. <laughs> What's your one go-to? Well, um, I kind of have two, but one is I think every business owner should ask themselves, what what would you do if you faced that cyber attack today? Um, and then really kind of do a self audit of your business. One of the easiest ways, and I'm not this is not me trying to necessarily get the business, but complete a cyber liability application. That's kind of a self audit and really help you kind of map out that business, like your business risk profile. Um, I've seen applications that have one page, but it covers a lot of information and they're just like the yes and no. Um, and then I have some that are, you know, four and five pages long and a little more extensive, but I mean, just doing that application can, um, just kind of be eye opening and you can kind of take that, make a list off of that and you can take it to Chris and Chris say, Hey, these are some things that we don't have. And he can just kind of lay out all the things that you could potentially set up to, um, to, you know, limit that exposure. Perfect. 
Chris? If you want to send the application oh. to me, I'll t- if you want to send the application that you completed, then that self audit to me, I, we can go from there. <laughs> Perfect. Chris, what's your, you might get two go tos because you're the IT guy, but right. <laughs> what's your first? What's your first one? Well, you know, we've already we've already spoken about um, training your staff, um, whatever that looks like to be appropriate for your business and your industry. We already talked about that. The one that we haven't touched on, um, except in passing, is two factor authentication. Mm. And that is when we talk about account takeovers and, and email compromise, um, that reduces 99.9% of your risk of having those accounts taken over. Um, can so you, every single thing- Can you define two-factor authorization? Yeah. For, for so example? it's real simple. Two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, you'll see it referenced, um, just means you have two, two things that are required for you to log in. One is your password. That's something that's known. And it's something you have. So whether that's a phone or a secure card or, or a plug-in device. So essentially, when you go to log into your email or to Facebook or to Dropbox, you put in your password and then a password pops up on your phone or a, a one-time use code pops up. And you have to also type that in Got to it. verify your identity. Okay. So we've done this for years and years and years and years at banks when you have that little, that old school um, RID token that you keep in your desk drawer to, to punch in the code. Same, same thing. Um, it's just, you know, now it's more, more technology driven. Um, obviously, your password is not secure anymore. Someone in China, someone in Russia, they have your password, accept it, move on. So now that we know your password is not secure, we have to have something that you personally have with you to verify your identity. So that's the two-factor authentication. Is. So if someone tries to log in, um, they can't do it uh, because they hopefully don't also have your phone. Perfect. So that's the biggest thing. Everything you can, every account that you can turn to factor on, do so. Perfect. I will leave you with my two. Uh, actually, I'm just going to do one. Going back to our, our go-to tool that we've implemented, and I don't know if you've worked with this vendor or not, Chris, but uh, we use No Before for our mm-hmm. cybersecurity training. Um, it's not prohibitively expensive. Um, it, it really isn't. It's, it does require effort on everybody's part to complete the training, um, but it has a lot of the features that Chris mentioned as far as testing users' response to emails and helping you come up with a, a, a education plan and, and all of those things. So no B4, I think it's the number four, um, is, is my, my tip or trick. Um, I have one last question question. Ah, no. All right. Chris has shared his, his, his uh, booking link uh, in the chat. Um, I will. Yeah, that's actually for, that's actually, if you want a copy of a book that we have written about oh. business email compromise. Oh, nice. <laughs> Perfect. That's awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate the panelists uh, participation. You guys were awesome. And uh, I will end the recording with a wave. We wave until the camera is off.